and all that he's done for us. Uh, we have much to cover tonight, and I'm going to uh, prayerfully divide the subject matter into two uh, auspices, which means two lessons. We're going to continue in the book of Revelation and setting uh, you up with some terminology uh, that uh, you will need to understand as we go throughout the book of Revelation. And uh, as I read uh, Revelations uh, probably now for the maybe 20th time in my lifetime and to study it, there were terms that I saw that uh, glared out. And so I've given you a handout with the allegories of the book of Revelations. And they're in the back. The second is uh, the handout regarding the birthing of your gift and your gift sets. And so what I'd like to be able to do is to go into the gift sets because I've had a quandary of questions regarding assignments and gift and going in the flow of God from two Sundays ago, I thought um, and prayed that I would create a PowerPoint that would help you understand what your assignments are and what your gifting is. Uh, and there are several scriptures that come to mind when we refer to gifts. There are gifts of the Spirit, and the book of Corinthians talks about that. There are fruit of the Spirit, uh, and that's known in, I believe, in Galatians. But I want to talk about how do you come to know what your assignment is and how should you react to that assignment. And so before we get into the word of the Lord, let's go ahead and have a short word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we honor you and we thank you for your wonderful goodness and your magnificent mercy and all that you have done for us and how you have kept us safe, kept by your power. It's not by our power or by our might, but it's by your spirit. That's what you have said. Give us revelation tonight, understanding of your word, and then teach us, oh God, how to operate within the word that you have given. Give us this day our daily bread. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask if you, uh, someone would adjust uh, the lights for this PowerPoint presentation on <clears throat> tonight so that um, we'll give you an aspect of, of the word of the Lord. And, and certainly there has been such a uh, quandary um, of this subject matter. And it really has to deal with what you have been called to do and how you should operate in that gift. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, the very first chapter of the book of Ephesians, and then he reiterates it in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, that God knew us before the foundation of the world was ever created. And because he knew us, that means that he has a plan for us. That plan can also be called an assignment. Some call it a calling. God calls us out of darkness, according to Colossians, into his marvelous light. So when the Lord calls us, he's calling us out of something 
into something, out of ourselves, out of sin, out of despair, out of confusion, into focus, into anointing, into gifting, into blessing. He never calls um, and not call us out to call us in. So the first thing you want to know that your calling is too set, it is too leveled. He's calling you from something to something. And even if you are saved, when he begins to call you, he's calling you to a greater level of understanding or a greater level of work, greater level of revelation. And then the Bible tells us that when he calls us, too much is given, much then is required. So when God calls us out of something into something, he then attaches two things, accountability and responsibility. Accountability is to something. Responsibility is for something. So God is uh, perceptional. He is three-dimensional in that when he calls us, he wraps us with accountability and he wraps us with responsibility. We are accountable to someone. And we all know this, that no one is an island to themselves. He never calls you just to be by yourself. And when he calls you, he calls you for training. He calls you for expertise. He, he calls you for a deeper reasoning or rationale in him. And then he calls you to or for responsibility. So those things are important. I am accountable to someone. Not only am I accountable to my apostle, but I'm also accountable to this church. I'm accountable to my wife. Um, I, I'm accountable um, to uh, the Longwood University. I'm accountable to those people who have invested in me to accomplish something. But I'm also responsible for something. So God never calls you and makes you responsible for nothing. Uh, if you're gifted, you then have a responsibility to work within that gift. He never gives you a gift and you become the Lone Ranger. He never gives you a gift and you can just operate that gift however you see fit without any confinement, without any uh, parameters, without any rules or laws. So when God gifts you, he never gifts you just to nilly willy, just to do whatever you want. He, he gifts you to be accountable. So your gift must be accountable to someone. Yeah. The Bible tells us that the spirit is subject to the prophet, but also the prophet is signed and, and responsible and accountable to a higher order. What is that higher order? The higher order is explained in Ephesians chapter number four. And he says, I have given some to be apostles. I've given some to be um, um, evangelists. I've given some to be prophets, pastors, and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the body of Christ. So um, the government of God in the dispensation of grace has a covering of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the body. So that is a gift. It is a gift that God gives uh, to the body of Christ to perfect us. So he uses his government to birth giftings okay he burst the gift gifting now the there's a difference between the birth of the gift and the gift being inside you okay 
The birthing means he placed it in you, but the birth means it now is manifest. So if you are gifted, and everyone is, you must manifest or make an appearance or make an assurance or showing that that gift exists. And so tonight we want to talk about what is that birthing of the gift. We all know that there is something that we do better than others. There are things, and it has nothing to do with being braggadocious, being boastful, but some of us can do some things, particularly as it relates to the body of Christ, better than others. And how do we know it's better? It is easy for us. Some people struggle to speak. Some people struggle to sing. Some people struggle to preach. Or some people struggle to study. And, but for some of us, it becomes natural. And I've heard someone say, I can even do this in my sleep. And you have to be careful when it becomes natural and, it, and it's easy because God can give you a gift, but no repentance is attached to it. So you can be gifted and people still smoke, drink, um, sin, curse. There are many gifted men and women in the body of Christ, but they may not be gifted with accountability. Mm. So, so I have the gift of prophesying and people come to me. I'm not talking about me, but someone may have that gift of prophecy and people come to me. But that gift must have an accountability partner or accountability partners. Why? Because it's so easy for us to become puffed up. We become braggadocious. And then we might believe that the body of Christ, Ecclesia, can't operate without us. And so the accountability um, makes sure that we stay within the lines. Even when you're not saved, you have an ability that seems to stand out more than usually, which means even before you're saved, the, the gift that's inside you was there before God called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Some are gifted by God but never come to repentance. I think of a person, well, I don't know what happened between life and death, but I think about a person called Michael Jackson. The guy was gifted in music. There are a lot of other things he did that I don't like, but he was gifted in music, and he was gifted as a child. He just had a melodious tune. And, and it caused people to be attracted to him. So even before you're saved, even before you even start in, in church and, and your mind is dedicated to, to, to serve God, he puts in you gifts. I've seen people that had the gift to sing um, and they were still seeking the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I've seen people who have the gift of administration, the gift of bringing people together, the gift of leading, the gift of speaking. Um, some people can just say things and they come to pass. Um, they have, uh, they call it mother's wit, but let's call it for all intents purposes, according to Isaiah chapter number 11, uh, the spirit of wisdom. They just have the ability or the gift to give right answers. The questions are when it starts, when you start dealing with the gift is, what is it? What is a gift? It is something that other people don't have. Bottom line. It is something that God puts inside of you. And it may manifest physically, but he puts it in you spiritually. 
And it's not a gift. It's not something that, that necessarily you have to acquire skills for, but you have to mature. But it's just there. It's just there. And it is a gift that God gives to you to give it back to him. He gave us a gift called Jesus. For God so loved the world that he, he gave his only begotten son. So he gave a gift, but the gift was for us, but it was for his glory. So God gives you something, an assignment, skill, gifting, calling, so that he might be glorified. Anytime the gift glorifies you, you're in trouble. Okay, just a little. The Bible says a little leaven Leaven the whole lump. The moment we take the glory for what God has planted in us, that's leaven, which is called sin. And the sin of presumptuousness or the sin of pride. Okay? So it comes from God. The Bible tells us all good and perfect gifts come from above. That's the scripture. So the gift comes from God. Where did it come from? It came from above. So when someone compliments you on your gift, the question is, is it your gift? Is it your gift? It's not your gift. It's the gift of. So when someone gives you honor and glory for something that you have done that you are gifted, who should get the glory? Who should get the thanks? So why do we say thank you? <laughs> oh, that was a beautiful message. Why, thank you. To God be the... You might want to put that and add that into your vocabulary. To God be the glory. Hmm. Because the moment people start... Feeding your flesh. You know what I mean by feeding your flesh. They feed your mind. You then be think, you think, oh, I can do this and nobody else can do this. And now I'm not going to do it because they're going to have to call on me to do it. God gives you the gift. It comes from above. And it is intended that you would give him the glory. You give him, and what I mean by glory, you honor God for what he's given you. If you can sing, give him the honor. If you can solve issues, give him the honor. If you can teach, give him the honor. And the more honor he give, you give to him, guess what he does? Give and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken over. Running over shall men give unto your bosom. So when you honor God with your gift, he then gives you more. Touch your neighbor and say, I've got more than one gift. Some of us have five or six gifts. Some of us have a treasure trove. We can just stick our hand in the gifted pocketbook and just pull out something, and it works. You know why? First of all, God gives it as he sees fit. But hear this. When you give God glory and you give it back to him, he gives you more. And I don't know about you, but this is the season of more. And I'm not talking about money, cars, and houses. I'm talking about I want more spirit. I want more revelation. I want more worship. I want more discernment. I want more prayer. I want more anointing. I want more glory. Because if I get the anointing and the glory and the prayer and the discernment, first seek ye the kingdom of God and all of these things and, 
and all of his righteousness. And what? These things shall be added unto you. Look at somebody say, if I seek the kingdom, I don't even have to ask. It will be added to the contract. But oftentimes what we want to do, we want to get it to add to ourselves. But when you give it to the kingdom, give it back to the kingdom in terms of glory. He says, I'll add stuff. I'll give you houses that you didn't even build. I'll give you wells that you didn't even dig. Y'all didn't hear what I said. I'll give you stuff you didn't even ask for. Any witnesses in the house? I didn't even ask for it, but it was added unto me. You give him glory, he adds. The more glory you give, mm, the more glory he gives. The higher you push, the more glory he pushes down. That's why they said you can't beat God. You will never outgive God. I want to tell you that again. You can never outgive God. He won't allow you to outgive him. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm gifted. But how much can I stand? Ooh. I'm gifted, Lord. But can your borders be expanded? Do I have a little sippy cup? Or do I have a 12-gallon gorge? Lord, just fuel me and let me run over. Some of you are running over, but you got a teacup. And, but if you run over, you're running over. But at nearly 60, I don't want just a teacup. I want a 15-gallon oil pen. I, I mean, I want a drum. He'll give you according to your capacity. Yeah, really. Woo. Yeah. Say this and affirm this. Lord, expand my territory. How much can you handle? If you've got little, it's only because you can handle little. Lord, expand my territory. I got this one gift, and I don't want to hide this gift. I'm going to use this gift to your glory. I'm going to magnify this gift. If it's just one gift, I'm going to give you all the glory, and I'm waiting until you give me another gift, or you multiply the gift, or you quadruple the gift. How is your gift confirmed? We're going to talk about that. When can it be used? These are the questions that go with about the birthing of your gifts. As guidelines to this topic, I'd like to use the book, the books of Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 and Matthew 25, 15 through 30. So let's get that real quick and let's, let's begin to read. Now y'all going to have to forgive me. The Lord gave me this download actually at about one o'clock this morning. And I'm just typing. I really am. I'm, I'm typing this. And so if you see some grammatical errors, please forgive me. I tried to um, look at it as much as I could today to make sure that, um, um, I didn't make any errors, but the, it just, the Lord began to speak to me and um, I began to type. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. This is what is going on. There, there is a conversation, Jeremiah chapter 1 through 11, Jeremiah is really talking to himself and God is speaking to him, okay? This is called a soliloquy, 
Everybody say a soliloquy. A soliloquy is like you're talking, but then God is responding to you. Hear this. Hmm. You are talking, but God speaks to you the answer with your own lips. God, what shall I do? I told you what I, I told you what you should do. That's called a soliloquy. When you talk to yourself, but it's in the first and the third person simultaneously. You're talking to God, but God talks to you through your own mouth. So here is Jeremiah asking almost a hundred questions from Jeremiah chapter one to chapter number 11, trying to figure out why did you call me to be a prophet? And, and we understand that God chooses this, this young fellow at a very young age. At least the rabbis suggest maybe about 19 or 20 years old, he becomes a preacher. No, he becomes a prophet. And, and now he's struggling with the call in his life based on not being educated, being young, and being poor. All right. And on top of that, there, 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 there was some people out there that were prophet killers. They didn't like prophets and prophetess to speak on the behalf of God. So 29, 11 through 13, and this is what, you know, Jeremiah is questioning God. He's, why you have me telling them to repent? Why are you telling me to tell Babylon to repent? Why are you telling me to tell Israel to repent? And, and what is it in it for me, Lord? And, and, and Jeremiah is, is literally asking the question. He's asking the question. He, he, he is speaking this. What is that called? That is called the Dora. Everybody said the Dora. The T, no, not Dora, Torah. T O R A H. Torah. The Torah is the rabbinical oral storytelling of the Old Testament. The Torah. You have the Tanakh, you have the Talmud, and you have the Torah. And the Torah is uh, the telling of oral Hebraic history. And so. Um, this, this, this part is uh, um, a rabbi who's telling the story of Jeremiah. So he, he, he puts on the character of Jeremiah, telling the story to other prophets, to the school of prophets. And so Jeremiah asks a question, God responds. And this is what he responds. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me. And find me when ye shall search for me with everybody say those last three words. He said, You have so many questions and you can't find the answer. But you will have the answer when you seek me with all your heart. That's powerful. What did that remind him of? And in the cross reference there, it takes us back to Exodus chapter number 20. And God speaks through the Ten Commandments, starting at verse 4, I believe. 
and I want you to worship me. I want you to serve me with all of your might, with all of your mind, with all of your energy. Seek me. That's a commandment. I want you to worship me with tenacity, with, with spunk, with energy, with enthusiasm. And he says, when you give your whole heart to me, I'll open up revelation. I'm preaching to you right now. Some of you are looking for an answer from God. And God said, I won't give you the answer until you worship me enthusiastically. Until you praise me with all of your energy, with all of your mind, with all of your intellect. Regardless of what people think, what they say, or what they see. I want you to give me the glory. Even when you don't feel like giving him the glory. And he said, if you give me all, I'll give you all and some more. He said, give me your all. Your all what? Your whole heart. That means your spirit and your soul. Give me your spirit, your personality, your character. Give me your consciousness. In the night watches, I will meditate upon you. I will bless the Lord at You know what all times mean? All times does not just speak to time. All times mean I'm giving you everything I got. Everything I have. My creative being longs for you, Lord. I wish you could experience riding down the road and thinking about the goodness of the Lord. And, 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 and it's not a sound that comes out of my mouth, but a tear comes down from my eye when I think about his benefits and I think about his mercy. I may not even say thank you, but the tear is suggestive. I will praise you with my whole heart. Have you ever worshipped him with your whole heart? He said, Jeremiah, I'll speak to you if you give me your whole I don't want some of it. Lord, I, I don't want a third of it. I don't want a fourth of it. I don't want a half of it. Lord, I, thank you. I want it. Oh. Why? Because I'm a jealous God. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I'm a jealous God. So when you search me with all of your heart. Now, how do you search God with all of your heart? One of the things that I'm trying to teach you is you got to be a praiser. Look at somebody that said, Lord, give me the gift of praise. Yes. I will bless the Lord at all times in his praise. Shall continually be. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, I bless you. That's a gift. Some people complain. Some people murmur. Some people speak fear. But I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. When I'm on the campus of Longwood. Thank you, Jesus. When I'm 30,000 feet in the air, thank you, Jesus. When I'm on the trail, thank you, Jesus. When I'm in the subway, thank you, Jesus. In the midst of my trouble, thank you, Jesus. At the height of my mountain, thank you, Jesus. When I'm getting in the grief, thank you, Jesus. When I'm poor, thank you, Jesus. When I'm well, thank you, Jesus. When I'm sick, thank you, Jesus. When I'm upset, thank you, Jesus. When I'm lonely, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you. That's a gift. Just touch somebody and say, it's a secret. When you praise him, he inhabits your situation. 
The Bible says he inhabits those that praise him. So when two or three come together, he said, I don't care if you're in hell or if you're in heaven. I'll be there in the midst. Now you might have a gift of praise, but this body has a gift of praise. That's why I'm always pushing you to praise God. It's a gift of our local assembly. We know how to praise God. We always take time out to give him praise. And when we praise him, he gives us revelation. When we praise him, he gives us a miracle. When, he, when we praise him, he heals my body. Hallelujah. Somebody give God a praise right now. Give him a gift. Of Somebody need gas in your tank? Give him praise for the gas you already have. You need money in the bank? Give him praise for what you already have. Matthew's 25. Let's turn to Matthew's 25. 15 through 30. Matthew's 25, 15 through 30. Here is Jesus actually talking to his disciples. And uh, he, he, he's trying to give them, it's an allegory, but the word allegory here is replaced with the word parable. And, and, and an allegory is a story, but a parable is a short story with a hidden meaning. Yes. Parable, allegory, they are um, the same, synonym. Yes. It's a synonym. Amen. They mean the same it's it's symbolic and so jesus is trying to understand uh help his disciples to understand what is the kingdom of heaven like and i've told you all there's a difference between the queen kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of god and one has to deal with the throne heaven the the actual location of heaven and then one has to deal with the principle of godliness and, and he, he said, I want you to um, understand. And, and he starts off with ten virgins. <laughs> and he talks about the kingdom having ten virgins. Five yeah. were wise and five were foolish. And then they didn't get it. They really didn't understand. So he gives them another allegory he gives them another parable and it, it it goes like this maybe let's go back to 14 so you can get the whole thing for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods and unto one he gave five talents to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his, hear that, several ability. Yes. What is several ability? That means capacity. He never over gifts you. Amen. Okay. He never gives you a gift and you can't handle it. That's right. Amen. You may not control it. 
<laughs> you may not live in balance, but he'll never give you more than what you can handle. So how is it that people that are so gifted, they end up doing s such monstrous things? Come on, somebody. Amen. R. Kelly. Gifted. But no accountability. The owner of, what's the, f the owner that was caught in this brothel? Craft, the owner of the New England Patriots, worth six billion dollars. What is he doing in a brothel? Come on. No accountability. And so when you when you have a gift, that gift is called passion. Now touch somebody and say, you better watch your passion. Because the same thing that will bless you <laughs> is the same thing that will put you in jail. Bill Cosby knows about that. Who's this man, um, Trump's um, um, political advisor and led his election? Went to jail for three and a half years. Gifted. Cohen, gifted. Trump, gifted. Obama. Oh, y'all didn't like that. Look at your face. No, he's not talking about my president. No, he's your president. Gifted. but no responsibility or Amen. accountability. Amen. So that same gift to dance, the enemy will use that to dance for the world. Amen. The gift to be creative, he'll use that. And it's called perversion. When your gift becomes a curse, it is perverted. That's what Satan did with Adam and Eve. So y'all you, you, know everything. Did God tell you <laughs> that if you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, that you will become like him? He perverted the truth. And they ate it. Lots of people in church are gifted, but it's per it's perverted. It's used with evil intent. That's why you have to have accountability. I can't be a bishop of twenty churches and not be accountable. Or oh, that might go to my, I might think I'm somebody. Come on, someone. And the accountability is, I'm even accountable to, to pastor. Okay. I don't just do things and not tell folks. Even before I do them, we have a shepherd's meeting. Come on, somebody. Amen. Look at somebody and say, it may be a surprise to you, but it better not be a surprise to him. <laughs> because I'm accountable to you, but I'm accountable to him. I'm blowing y'all away here. Moses had a minister. His name was called Joshua. And he was accountable to Joshua, even though Joshua was below him. You can read the scripture in Exodus. 
He was Moses' minister, but not at the same rank. Oh, my, I'm in trouble here. Touch somebody and say, you're not going to tell me what to do. If you're below me or you're at the same status of me. You're not going to tell me what to do. You're not the bishop. I, I hear it in the spirit. You're on the same level as I am. But where does serving one another? <laughs> Say it, sister. You just said it. We're to submit to one another. And love. Yeah. Come on. So I may be the chief here, but the chief has to serve. Amen. I've got to submit to somebody. Amen. <laughs> so my question is, who do you submit to other than Bishop? Okay. Come on, sir. We're not finished reading here. <laughs> and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway he took a journey, took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and what? He traded with the same and made them other five talents. So he had the talent, and, and in this case, it means money, Drach, drachnas, okay? He's got drachnas, and, and, and that's a, a currency in, in Hebraic, drachnas. And so he, he, he has these 120 drachnas, and he goes and invests in trade, and he gets a return on his drachnas, and he adds 100%. Okay, and likewise, he that had received two, he then went out and traded and got a return 100%. Doesn't matter what your capacity is, but that you are filled. Your capacity is filled. Mm, mm. I hear you, Lord. So you think it's all for you. So your car is just for you, and your house is just for you, and your job is just for you. Well, the way you multiply it, you've got to give it. It's called investment. A hand closed will never lose the money. But a hand closed will never receive any either. So if your hands remains closed, watch what this other guy does. He keeps his hand closed. Nothing goes out. However, nothing comes in. And God doesn't give you a gift. And at that great day, he's going to just look for the gift he gave you. He's going he's to say, you know, I gave a commandment in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, 25, that you multiply. Be Did it say fruitful and add? Did he say fruitful and subtract? Fruitful and divide. No. Fruitful and multiply. multiply. Say it. Lord, give me the gift of multiplication. Lord, give me the gift of multiplication. That's been my prayer this year. That's been my prayer in 2019. Give me the gift of multiplication. Not one car, three cars. I'm serious. I'm I, I want to give some away. Not one house, but five houses. I'm serious. Not a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. Multiplication. Not to keep for myself, 
the more I give, the more he Look at yourself and say, am I still broke? What have you given? Who have you given it to? Who have you mentored? I'm not talking about your children and your grandchildren, baby kids. Uh, I'm not talking about them. Who have you mentored? Who have you invested in? Not for pay. So teachers, those of you that teach kids and you're getting paid for it, you're just doing your job. What do you do outside of your contract hours? Come on, sir. That's it. Amen. Come on. What do you do on Saturday? What do you do on Sunday? Who would say right now, I'm glad you came into the world because you've made the world a better place to live in? Who would, who? How many people would say, I'm glad that you came into the world? Mm. Or are they saying, I'm glad when you leave? Y'all quiet. Y'all were speaking in tongues just a few moments ago. You were, you were just speaking in tongues. What have you done to help somebody go to the next level and not look for something in return from them? But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid the Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants come and reckoneth with them, so that he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, Thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping while thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and lazy servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming I should have received my own with usury, which means with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which had 10 talents. So he took the talent that the man had won and he gave it to the man that had 10. Touch your neighbor and say, I'll take your blessing any day. I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it. I won't steal it, but if you won't use it, 
I'll take it. Come on, somebody. I'll take the talent. Okay, you don't like that word? Lord, give it to me then. I'll say it. Let me pray. Lord, give me the talent. Because when you don't use it, hello, somebody. God said, I won't let it die. See, when, when you don't use your talent, you don't lose it. You really don't lose it. You stand in judgment for it. So you never lose it. You didn't use it. And now what you didn't use, you can tell God, I lost it. He said, no. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. You didn't use it. Now you're going to be judged for what you did not do. Hello, somebody. Amen. Lord, give it to me. Give it to me, Lord. Oh. We can't even imagine the abilities that God has given us. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when we see him, we will be like him. For we shall see him as it is. Eyes haven't seen. Ears have not heard. Come on, somebody. Touch yourself and say, there's a bottomless pit of giftedness inside of me. He said, if you drink this water out of your belly shall flow a river of living water. So I've got a source inside of me. All I have to do is use what I have. It may not be like someone else's. I'm going to use it with excellence. Hello. So you were given a gift. Why? Well, I didn't want it in the first place. And oftentimes, God gives us something. And we say, I didn't want it. So because I didn't want it, I don't use it with X. You're still going to be judged. Too much is given, which means judgment. And there are five judgments. We talked about that. And the saints are being judged today. For example, Moses, a Hebrew, was hidden away for a season until the right time for his true, true calling to work in. So what is it? We would like to think that we had something to do with our gift. We do use them now, but the question is, how do we use them? Satan, a fallen angel, has a gift of music. It was one of his most strongest gifts. It's a little cut off there. Saul was chosen by God to lead the people and was appointed the gift of leadership. Joseph had the gift of interpretation of dreams and used them to help others. This is a very easy answer for we know that in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 that God gave him his gift for the sole purpose of getting Judah in order. This question sets up another statement. We do nothing on our own. The things that we do within our gifts. When was the last time you thanked God for your gift? I guarantee you most of us in here complained about it. Complain and excuse as to the reason why we don't use the gift that's inside of us. When's the last time you thank God for your gift? We have skills, but God gave us these skills to be 
who we are in the body of Christ. How is the gift confirmed? Let's take a, a look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 11. Jeremiah, quickly. Somebody's going to have to read that for me. Jeremiah 1, verse 11. Look at what God does. He doesn't just give it to him. He queries him. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 11. Who, who has it? Come on, read, daughter, please. Oh, hold it. Everybody got it? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse number 11. Come on, daughter. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me. There's a soliloquy. Remember what I said? The Lord is speaking to Jeremiah. He's talking to himself. He answers himself. The word of the Lord came unto me saying what? Jeremiah. What do you see? Woo. That's a message to somebody tonight. What do you see? That see? And that word there means what has been revealed to you. And whatever has been revealed to you, you are now accountable for it. You become accountable when God reveals to you all these blessings of mine. So whose fault is it if I don't get the blessings, all the blessings? Ask yourself, what am I looking at? I know what you're looking at because you have a slave mentality. You only look at what others say you can look at. You only see by the limitation of your cerebral cortex. Only what you can see with your eyes. But that's not what God was asking him. If you can see it, I'm going to give it to you. Hmm. Some things he gives, some things you earn. The giving part is easy because we want God to give to us. But what about being faithful? Hmm. Then God asked him a second time. Because what he said was, uh, yeah, uh, well, 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 well. He, he saw it. But God is trying to say, okay, what is the excuse now? Why aren't you getting this? Why aren't you doing this? He doesn't answer himself. Jeremiah, what did you see? Jeremiah, what did you see? When God shows you your gift, you become accountable. Man, the gift does not automatically manifest itself. Amen. That's right. Sometimes you need training. Yeah. Touch your neighbor and say, I think I need a whipping. I really. I <laughs> Who likes whippings? I do. <laughs> if I'm giving them. I like them. <laughs> but I don't like them when I get them. Whom the Lord loveth, he chaseth. So he causes us to see ourselves. Not as others see ourselves, see us, but as he sees us. Woo! God, with his great wisdom, always gives you confirmation. Today, God has prophets, apostles, pastors, bishops, evangelists to help encourage you in your gift. God can always use your parents. Hear this. I'm going to really deal with this. Parents 
are critical to children. Those of you that have children, even if they're adults. God gives children parents to help the children harness their giftings. Oftentimes, gifts run within families. People who have a business sense, they didn't just get a business sense. Oftentimes, they, they got it from parents. Children of musicians, oftentimes, not always, are musicians. Because if you stay around music all day, sooner or later, you're going to uh, gravitate to that. God uses parents, particularly fathers, to speak into the lives of his children. The greatest sin, I believe, the greatest sin is a father that does not speak into his sons or daughters. Yes, amen. Yes. Jesus. And many of you are suffering right now. Jesus. Yes. Your father may have been there and your father may have provided, but he didn't speak into your life. Yes. And you're still wondering, at 35, at 40, at 50. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. That's what fathers do. Hear the scripture. And, and, and this is the dilemma of the church today. We got 10,000 teachers, but not many fathers. We got great Prolific teachers in this house. But not many fathers. Fathers that are only concerned about themselves. And not the children. I'm talking to the men. When was the last time you spoke into a child's life here at the crystal that weren't yours. There are children here that are here in the absence of their father. I know you're a father to your children, but what about the children that don't have a father? Or the father is not in the house. They become invisible to you. It's not my problem. Whew. Quiet. My role is not to make you feel comfortable. That's right. As a father of this house, my role is to speak into your life and harness the gifts. That means to develop the gifts that God has given you. Fathers are prophetic. Yes. They speak the future. Yes. Amen. We may be poor now, but you won't be poor. That's what my dad said to me. I work in the heat, but you will never work in the heat. I struggle to make bills payment. You will never struggle, Maurice. He spoke that. Guess what? You are going to school. Thank you, Lord. I mean college. Thank you, Jesus. At five years old, I remember my father talking to me and saying, you're going to college. 
You want to know how I became a doctor? Because my father spoke it. You're going to be another Martin Luther King. I didn't want to be a Martin. Okay, I really didn't. I wanted to be a Malcolm, but he spoke it because of the era I grew up in, you know. But what did I become? A Martin. In some aspects. Yeah, come on. In some aspects. I give him all the honor. I do. I am who I am because he spoke it. I'm a bishop because my father in the gospel spoke it. Even before I became a minister, you're going to be a bishop. I'm looking at him. Were you the bishop? Never thinking he was going to pass the torch to me. I couldn't preach. He said, one day, he said, one day, I hope I'm alive. I don't know. You're going to be a preacher. And I couldn't preach, you all. But he spoke it. And when he spoke it, I became it. When God said, let there be light, when he spoke it, it manifests. So why won't you let me speak into your life? If you don't have a natural father and your father can't speak and he doesn't have the, 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 the withal, let me speak into your life. I'll never curse you. I'll never abuse you. I won't molest you. I won't sexually assault you. I won't emotionally strap you. All I want to do is speak into your life. Hallelujah. Speak into my life. See my gifts and speak to the gifts that are within me. Somebody open your mouth and say, I break the curse, I break the curse of dysfunction of my family. Some of you are still living in your dysfunction because of what your father said or didn't say. But the Lord has brought me into your life, not to brag, but to speak into your life. This curse must end. This trauma must end. This dysfunction must end. Poverty must end. I speak prosperity. I speak direction. I speak happiness. In the name of Jesus. It must come to pass. All these blessings are yours. Glory. Hallelujah. But why won't you receive it? You're still living under the curse of dysfunction with such a great gift in you. Gift of mediocrity. Gift of lack of self esteem. Come on, somebody. The devil's gift of mediocrity. The devil's gift of lack of self-esteem. The devil's gift of poverty. The devil's gift of anger. The devil's gift of frustration. But I've come to speak against the demon that's trying to curse you. Did you hear what I say? Trying to curse you. Because no weapon that's formed against you. I don't care what he's saying. I don't care what he's doing. I don't care what he's trying to speak in your mind. Your spiritual father is on my face blocking the curse. You want to quit. You want to leave. But something keeps you because your father is praying for you. Don't let them backslide. Don't let them lose their mind. Don't let them become so disgruntled that they can't bless folk. Thank you, Jesus. 
Somebody open your mouth and say, I need the blessing of my father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every time I came into the presence, and even now when I come into the presence of my father, I always say, because his time is limited. And then I say, touch me. Lay your hand on me. Every time I see you, I want to be blessed. Give me something. Say something that's going to make my life better. I told my bishop, every time I come into your presence, lay your hand on me. Yes. Hallelujah. So I can lay my hand on other men. So I can lay my hand on other women and bless them and break their curses and break the poverty and break the mess. I've been touched to touch others. So why won't you let me lay my hand on you? Why won't you let me speak a blessing in you? Give him a praise right now. Come on. Give him a praise. Give him a praise. Lay your hand on me. Lord, lay your hand on me. Lord, lay your hand on me. Lay your hand on me, Lord. Lay your hand on me. Hallelujah. Some of you would be delivered tonight if you let me lay my hand on you. It is not to curse you or bewitch you, but it is to break the power that you've been struggling with. To break the curse of confusion. To break that anger. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm going in right there. Hallelujah. Somebody, God want me to lay my hand on you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Break every curse. Break it in the name of Jesus. Come on, give God a praise right now. Come on, give God a praise. 